Now we want to shift back to the beginning, and uh, I'll probably do uh, quite a bit of the talking, but my wife has some interesting uh, sidelights that she'll throw in from time to time. And, uh, you know, we'll begin back with uh, how we found out about Wildwood. Now, I grew up in the Adventist church. Uh, my father was a pastor. And uh, so I knew a lot about the Adventist church, but I never heard of Wildwood all my growing up years, all the way through school. Didn't know a place like this existed. But a day came that the Lord wanted to introduce this place to me. And it came through a call porter leader. I was doing some part-time call porter work. And uh, I was very impressed with this leader. His name was Joe Wedby. I suppose he's not living now. But he was the most dedicated and conscientious Adventist that I had ever met. Uh, now, I'd, I'd met a lot of people, and of course, I had teachers all the way through school. But there was something different about him. He had a real relationship with God. And so uh, when he would take me out to sell books, he told me about a place called Wildwood. Well, I didn't pay any attention to it at all at first. But uh, one day when we were on an outing, it was on Sabbath, there were a couple other people that uh, had close connections to know what Wildwood was about. And they weren't talking to me, but they were just talking to each other. And as they were talking, it was like the Holy Spirit said, you need to find out more about this. So the next time the call porter leader was taking me out, I asked him a bunch of questions about it. And he finally said to me, well, you ought to go there for at least six months. Because at that time, I was planning to go to Andrews and uh, take an advanced degree because it was already getting to the place where if you didn't have an advanced degree, you could forget about you know getting hired and so on. So my whole uh, life dream was to be a pastor. And so uh, then my wife's going to take over from there and share a little bit what happened. Well, when my husband was talking about Wildwood, I wasn't so sure about this Wildwood. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's interesting the way the devil works because everything that he heard about Wildwood was positive. I'd never heard of Wildwood either, but everything I heard was negative. <laughs> and, of course, I was the one that wasn't so anxious to go, and so the devil made sure I heard all the negative stuff. But at any rate, um, we came down here to visit, we decided we'd pay a visit here, and maybe my husband could tell you how he felt about our visit here, and then I'll tell you how I felt. <laughs> <laughs> well, we came down to look over Wildwood, and the first thing that hit me was these people are weird. Uh, several ways they were weird, it seemed to me. First of all, uh, the grass wasn't very neatly mowed. There was a lot of, you know, I had uh, been for quite a long time in Adventist institutions where every blade of grass was manicured and all the flower beds had no weeds. And, you know, it, it was just beautiful. And came here and thought, wow, this is terrible. And the way the ladies dressed was kind of shocking. And... Uh, we were worried about the food they would feed us. But the only thing that saved the day for us not to get totally turned off from coming here was uh, Warren Wilson. And, you know, there's a few of you know Warren Wilson. He passed away, unfortunately, about, at about 65 years old. So that's been a long time ago. But uh, we had an interview with him. 
And as he described the kind of educational program here, uh, just previous to coming here, I read the whole book of counsels to parents and teachers. And so when he was describing the kind of educational program that was here, I thought, wow, I've never heard of such a thing in the Adventist church. This is amazing that this kind of program is, is being carried on. So I was uh, very much impressed with what was going on here. And uh, I'm sure they invited us to dinner. Do you remember if they did or not? If they did, we wouldn't have accepted. <laughs> yeah, we, we decided uh, we didn't want to eat here. Uh, they were very hospitable. And uh, I'm sure they would have put us up for the night. But we didn't want to do any of that. And so uh, we... Uh, drove off the campus after the interviews were finished, and they told us that they could only take about a fourth of the applications back then. And I said, "Phew, good. No chance of us having go, to go there." But as we drove off the campus, the only way I can explain it is like a hundred-pound sack was put on my back. And I didn't tell my wife about it until bedtime, but it was just there. And the Lord gave another rebuke to us. We went to eat a meal in Chattanooga, and we didn't know that when you have green beans, they put pork in it down here in the south. And so we got our order, and here was some pork. So the Lord was saying, you should have eaten out there. But anyway, we proceeded on to the motel, and <clears throat> that night just before we went to bed and prayed together, I told my wife about this burden that was on my back. And so we agreed, she might have been a little reluctant, but we agreed that we were going to pray that God's will would be made known what we were supposed to do. And the 100-pound sack went from his back to my back. <laughs> <laughs> well, they had given us some literature, um, you know, another ark to build, uh, about cities of refuge and some of these other sermons that Elder Frizee had put together. And so as we left, uh, we went back to where we were living, which at that time was Tacoma Park, Maryland. And I began to read some of these things, and I began to get more and more convicted. At first, my reaction was, well, they can only take a fourth, so they probably won't take us. And it was even harder for them to take married couples or families back then. Uh, single students were easier. But uh, so at first we thought, especially uh, my wife, but me as well, thought, well, they won't have room for us. So the Lord's probably not going to lead us there. But the more I read, the more I became interested in it. And so we submitted the application to Wildwood. And shock of all shocks, they accepted us. You want to share anything about that? <laughs> yes, well, you know, sometimes you have a sense that maybe that's what the Lord wants you to do, so you just... I could tell my husband really wanted to go at least for six months, and I said, you know, anybody can survive anything for six months. It can't be that bad. But I did tell him, honey, you know, I'm willing to go there, but please don't expect me to dress like those people there. <laughs> Because I won't. <laughs> because, you know, in the, during the 60s, it was all the mini skirts and, you know, it was coming around again. But when I came to visit Wildwood, I mean, I had heard that they wear long dresses there. So I put on the longest thing I had, and it wasn't very long. <laughs> and so, 
But I just, I kept my mouth shut. I didn't say anything until the night when his dad came down from Pennsylvania. To, he had a truck to pack our stuff. And I think I cried all night. And he said to me, honey, why didn't you tell me that you felt this way and we wouldn't have gone? But there was something inside me that wouldn't let me say anything. Uh, the Lord is all I can say. <laughs> so, so we arrived at Wildwood. And when we arrived here, actually, in those days, every family had to live with another family for a while. And all the students lived in stu student homes. There were no dormitories. You had home heads. Uh, Before you get there, there was one okay. uh, providence that was, to me, evidence. You know, the Lord... He gives you enough evidence to where you know what you're supposed to do. And often, though, after you've made a decision based on the evidence he gives you, then he allows some things to happen that you think, oh, maybe I made a mistake. But don't listen to that. He gives you enough evidence in the beginning to make the right decision, and you need to go with that. That's a lesson we've learned over and over. But... The providence was that we had a television. In fact, I had been a television addict. My wife was not, but uh, I was a television addict. And so I knew that they didn't have any televisions here, and they wouldn't really be happy if we had brought one here. So we put the television up for sale. That was before the video you know, where you've got multiple uses for a TV. But uh, it didn't sell and didn't sell. And I'm not sure we both remember this the same, but as I remember it, it was the day before or the day of when we were to pack our things into the truck. And we knelt down to pray, Lord, please help us to sell this TV. And before the prayer was opened, there was a knock on the door, and a man came and bought the TV. <laughs> so we arrived at Wildwood, and like I said, everybody had to live with another family. And even in that, the Lord was so good, because he put us with the, the Hanson family. And fortunately, they had just come to Wildwood that year, too. So... We got along pretty well together. <laughs> and, you know, honestly and truthfully, if the Lord had put us anywhere else, I don't think we ever would have stayed. I mean, that was the perfect home to be in for us. And um, every day I wanted to leave. <laughs> I can tell you, every day I wanted to leave. Um, I worked in, the, in what's Mission Manor now, which was the old sanitarium. And I, I, had a, I had a lot of trials. I mean, they were trials to me. Now when I look back on them, they probably shouldn't have been trials. But the Lord knew he had a lot of work to do in me. And so um, <clears throat> I felt like I had just come from being a charge nurse. I had taken a four-year RN. So I had come from being a char charge nurse on the floor at the Washington Adventist Hospital. And I came to Wildwood to their little hospital, and it seemed like they didn't even want me to take a blood pressure, like they thought maybe I couldn't take one. And it was a little, I don't know, a little disconcerting to me. It was kind of because I hadn't been trained at Wildwood, I think, or maybe just because they didn't know me. I don't know. Because by the time we had been here, uh, like, I think the second year we were here, they had me teaching a nursing arts two class, so I guess things did change. <laughs> <laughs> One of the uh, trials we had was that they had a rule that you could not pick up your mail if you were a student. And, you know, we, we had been on our own for quite some time, and to come and have be told that you can't pick up your mail uh, seemed kind of ridiculous to us. And especially when um, we were older than them. <laughs> <laughs> And so, uh, fortunately, the, the Hansons didn't uh, apply that rule, and often my wife was able to pick up the mail for the whole house. That's why we say they, you know, they were really uh, the right family for us to come to. However, it was the house that uh, James lives in, and back then it was all one house. And so there were five bedrooms, and two bathrooms. 
And so we were given uh, two bedrooms, and uh, Hanson's had three bedrooms. But from our bedroom, we had to cross the hallway to get in the bathroom. And so I remember uh, going out of our bedroom, looking down the hall, and there's Dr. Hanson looking up <laughs> to see if you know we're out in the hallway. And it was kind of an interesting living situation. Another uh, thing we brought, we both liked what might be called sentimental music, you know, love music and sentimental music. But we, uh, we knew that, w that the music we listened to, they wouldn't like, so, so we didn't play it until one day they were gone for a while. And so by that time, I forget how long we'd been here. Maybe six months or so. Was it that long? Maybe not quite. But... And so the only music that we heard was what they played, which was what we call long hair. I don't really <laughs> care for that. But uh, I mean, there's some I, I enjoy. But I'd heard the beautiful music here in the chapel. And they had quartets. They had trios. They they had gr other groups, and the music was just beautiful. So when we got out our music to listen to it, I thought, wow, that's terrible music. <laughs> you mean that's what we used to like? And so it, it finished us off on listening to that music. If you think of any other things, just jump in. Uh, one really big trial for me here at Wildwood was that we, we were out of debt, praise the Lord. We didn't owe anybody anything. When we came and we had a brand new car, and so we, uh, we were going to be students, and we expected to spend the money that we had on tuition. Well, <clears throat> one time there was some kind of mistake in the way they kept track of the hours that had been worked. And so they sent me a big bill. I don't remember whether you were involved in, in that or not, but I remember the, the big bill they gave me. And uh, I was furious. I thought, you know, I've worked all these hours and they sent me this big bill. And so I, uh, I decided to go and talk to the, one of the leaders, which his name was Harold Damon. He was a, kind of a scary guy. He was pretty gruff and, and you know, not approachable. But uh, I found out he had a really soft heart because I, I explained to him about the situation and he just said, well, don't worry about it. We'll take, take it all off your belt. Now, if he'd said, well, I'm sorry, but, uh, you know, the, this is the way it is, and you're going to have to pay it, uh, we might have left. Oh, we would have left. Yeah. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I probably complained a fair amount to my husband, and he wasn't so happy either, but he knew better than to say anything to me. Because if he had complained at all, we would have been gone. <laughs> Yeah, so most of the time I didn't share with her uh, what was going on. Now, <clears throat> you know, a lot, I've seen through the years a lot of people come here uh, with a track record, say, as a pastor or a doctor or something else, and, and, and they get put forward really quickly into uh, higher positions. But because we came as students, even though I had a degree as a pastor, I, I didn't have any, uh, I never pastored a church yet. So uh, we started from the ground up. You know, they put me on the maintenance crew. The Lifestyle Center was being built at that time. And so when I first came, I was laying tile in uh, the, the dining room. That's gone now. I think we have a new covering there. But uh, yeah, it is gone. And then I was working on fixing the lights and things like that. And for someone that, you know, had been ready to, to have a, a sizable role in God's work, I, I was getting 
kind of frustrated. And so... It's called character development. And in <laughs> self-supporting work, you get a lot of it. <laughs> so I talked it over with my wife, and we decided that for one week, we would pray about the situation. And if nothing happened within a week, then we would go to the leaders and, and share with them the frustration that I was having. And so what I didn't know is if I had gone, they would have known I wasn't ready for any advancement. But I didn't know that. I, I didn't realize that. And so I, the Lord had to work quick. And I think it was either Wednesday of the week that we started praying that the education director came to me and he said, we need somebody to teach a class. Now, remember, I was really just a student myself, but he, he was impressed to ask me to teach a class. And so as a result of that, uh, my attitude improved greatly, and I felt like, well, I will get to do something except just the mundane things of life. Now, I enjoy the mundane things of life, but not only that. It, it's difficult for me on that. Then, um, and I, I wish we had kept the diary. I mean, we could tell you a lot better if we had kept the diary. We were far too busy to keep a diary. <laughs> <laughs> well, some people find a way, I don't know. But anyway, uh, it came to a point at which Elder Frizee felt convinced that he needed to turn over the leadership to someone else. I don't know what his age was, but he was probably around retirement age or fairly close to it. And uh, the one that he wanted for it was Warren Wilson. And so they had uh, meetings and discussion, and it was uh, decided that Warren Wilson would become president. He had been what was called the institute director. That's kind of the same duties that uh, James has had for a number of years here. And you were in charge of housing and in charge of accepting uh, all the people that came and, and who lived where and all that. So, of course, if he was going to be president, they were going to have to get somebody else to do some other duties. And so they came to me. This was a real surprise to me because I didn't know anything about it. They came to me and asked me to be the institute director. And so I had the privilege of, of working together with Warren Wilson. He was a wonderful man to work with. You know, he wasn't perfect. Nobody's perfect. But the Lord picked just the right man to work with me and to groom me and help me to, uh, you know, to become interested in self-supporting work. And we... Originally, we were only going to be here six months, but because of these events and because of God's conviction that it wasn't just a six-month time that he had called us to be here, but he had called us for a life work to be here. Now, only someone who really wanted to be a pastor can understand, but I had to give up, I thought. Now, you know the rest of the story, but... I had to give up the idea of being a pastor to do that because I didn't have any track record as a pastor. And so I, I was able, with God's blessing and help, and I have to give a lot of credit to my wife. She's been reluctant a number of times, but she's never uh, blocked me or tried to talk me out of what God was calling for me to do. And she's pitched right in, and things have gone way better than they would have been if she hadn't done that. So uh, 
As a result of that conviction and of these responsibilities, it was easy for me to see that God was calling us to be in this work. So, um, I began the work as an institute manager and, of course, got on the committees and on the boards, and pretty soon I was on the nominating committee, and so I was, uh, you know, I was in full, full steam into what was going on. And Warren Wilson and I worked really well together. We just clicked well. I didn't click so good with Elder Frizee. Uh, in fact, there was a one time when we had a committee, and I don't even remember what was being discussed. But I said something in the committee that must have irritated him. And he said, keep your hands off the pot of gold. I thought, ooh. I, uh, I wasn't used to that elder for Z. I had grown, I have to say I had grown to enjoy his sermons. Because for years, I went to Sligo, Seventh-day Adventist Church in Tacoma Park. In Sligo, uh, Bill Loveless was the preacher. And he was incredible in uh, sermons that just were amazing in detail and, and you know what most people want in a sermon. Elder Frizee was plain, simple, a Bible and spirit of prophecy. And so I don't remember how long, but it probably took four or five months before I could enjoy Elder Frizee's sermons. But once I started enjoying them, I really enjoyed them. And so this was such a shock to me. I, uh, I cherished in my mind, if I get a chance to leave Wildwood, I'm going to leave Wildwood. So that chance came after a while, but we'll share that shortly. But anyway, uh, he didn't know, you know, that he had hurt me like that, and I didn't say anything. We really should uh, follow Matthew 18 and, and say things. I know if I had gone to him and told him how much he hurt me, I'm sure he would have said he was sorry. And it could have been put behind us, but I, I didn't do that. And so uh, I don't remember how much longer um, we were here, but uh, one day Warren Wilson came to me and said, we need a leader at Beautiful Valley in West Virginia. And we've we're asking you to take that leadership. We had been here about two years. Yeah, about two years at that time. And uh, I think, if I remember right, we remained as students for about eight months, and then we started getting into, or especially I, into responsibilities. And so <clears throat> my wife and I prayed about it, and we thought about it. But we just didn't feel any conviction that we were supposed to do that. So a few weeks later, I, I, he was asking me about it. Warren Wilson is really the man who God used to spread self-supporting work around the world and collect self-supporting projects that were out there and, and had no connection. And so he was always uh, getting calls for people that were here to go and start something or uh, take over something. So anyway, he, uh, in fact, his wife told him one time, his wife said, if you don't keep sending people out of here, somebody's going to take your job. <laughs> well, he was sending them out, so... Uh, it was quite a while before anybody took his job. So the, uh, that day when he asked me the question about what my thoughts were, I said, you know, we've been praying about this, but we just can't 
seemed to get a conviction that we're supposed to do this. And his answer was quick. He said, well, then you're not supposed to go. And uh, so then we stayed on longer, and it was really right. We needed a lot more training before we were ready to run an institution somewhere else. And uh, I think it was a little over three years that we had been here, and a lot more committee work and so on. And they gave us the call again. And this time, it was not just to go and help Bill Dahl, but it was to take over from Bill Dahl because he was going to go to another institution up in British Columbia. So that time we prayed about it, and we felt convicted. And I said, praise God, I'll never go back to Wildwood again. I'm glad to get out of here and get into one of these other projects. And so we uh, moved to, eat, to a beautiful valley. Now, that is in a little tiny town called Arnoldsburg, West Virginia. And it is quiet. It's not like Wildwood with train tracks and freeway. It was quiet. They had several buildings there. It was back in a dead-end dirt road. And so nobody would go there unless they were coming to see you or made a mistake. And so it was a really good experience from that standpoint, but it was really pioneering. In the raw. <laughs> <laughs> we actually, we ran an academy there for two years. And we didn't really feel that academy work was our work. We were much more geared to college-age students that were more mature. But <clears throat> we were there for two school years. And um, I'm not sure why it was called Beautiful Valley. Because it was, I would have called it Mud Valley. There was mud everywhere. <clears throat> and we, had, we lived in a small trailer. And we had, I think it was three little camp trailers around us. At any rate, there were 13 of us that lived there, and we had one bathroom. And they were girls. <laughs> and it was at the time that I was pregnant with our youngest. And um, money was short. Food was short. It was really pioneering. Anyway, somebody gave us a load of turnips. Now, at best, I don't really care for turnips. <clears throat> but I did my best to use those turnips in every way possible. To disguise them, they couldn't be disguised, but I did my best to try to use those turnips. And finally, I said to my husband, we had a couple of workhorses there, and I said to my husband, you know, I'm so tired of these turnips. Can we just feed them to the workhorses? He said, yeah, I guess so. Even the workhorses wouldn't eat those turnips. <laughs> But, you know, during our years of pioneering, I learned how to be, um, how to live on very little money and also how to use whatever you had. I know this is getting a little bit ahead, but one time it wasn't there. It was actually at Lithia, which is our next step. But we had lots and lots and lots and lots of carrots. And I could present carrots in four or five different ways in one meal. But we used those carrots. <laughs> Yeah, the institution had a bumper crop of carrots, and they couldn't sell them all or use them all, so they gave us the carrots. Well, uh, Beautiful Valley was down in the bottom of kind of a V-shaped valley. You didn't get the sun till about 11 o'clock in the morning. And so one of the things they wanted to do there is to move the institution on, on top of the hill. They had some beautiful land with views and everything on top of the hill. And so we, uh, we set about to do that. We built a, a road going up to the top, and we got started with a house and all. But uh, the Lord called us away from there before we uh, got done. One lesson that I was, it was kind of a rebuke from the Lord. There was a neighbor, and this neighbor... Uh, 
saw Bill Dull as the answer because Bill was a very, very practical guy. And he saw him as the answer to all their practical needs. So whenever anything went wrong at their house, they would come up to the campus and they would tell us, you know, about it and expect us to do it. And one day I was thinking, you know, they don't even say thank you when you do it. And they don't care when they come. It might be on Sabbath or whatever. And they just expect us to do whatever they need done. And it was like the Lord, through the Spirit, spoke to my mind and said, you do that to me all the time. I said, oh. <laughs> so that changed my attitude to, uh, to helping these people. And, you know, one thing that happened later, they decided to move away. I didn't think they'd ever move away. But they decided to move away, and they came down and they offered the house to us first. And so we bought it and made it a part of the uh, complex there at Beautiful Valley. I don't, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't remember a lot from, from that time there. I mean, I remember probably the not-so-nice things. But, but um, the first year, I don't remember how many students we had. We had quite a few. But we had some problems with... Um, some of them that were down in the big house, they had gotten involved with Ouija boards somehow or other. And one Friday night after Vespers, we were, my husband was already at home, and we got this call, and we need you to come down here. There were lamps moving around and things moving around in the room, and they were really scared. And my husband was down there for hours before he came home. I don't know exactly what went on down there, but let me tell you, I was praying. <laughs> and then the second year... It seemed like we didn't have problems with the students. It went very well, but that year it seemed like we had a lot of staff problems. Yeah, one of the uh, struggles I had is that there were a lot of older leaders in self-supporting work. I was one of the younger guys. And some of them would come around and give calls to my staff to come and work with them. And that really got me unhappy. And stirred up about it. But what, what I didn't realize is the Lord was trying to teach me something. And finally what he taught me was, if they don't want to work with you, let them go. You know, you just want the ones that want to work with you. And so if, they, if they're supposed to be here and they're listening to God, they'll stay here. Well, there were times when I thought half of the staff were going to leave. But they didn't. And so we always had the staff we needed to carry on the work there. Uh, it was, you know, all training for me. Well, due to the time, we better hurry to uh, Lithia. Uh, just before I, uh, we left Wildwood, I was working with a man by the name of Jerry Franklin. And a few of you know him. Uh, he passed away, unfortunately, not too long ago. And he had a lot of experience. And so when I left, they gave him the, uh, the job that I had. And then maybe uh, a year, a year and a half after that, I came to a board meeting here in Wildwood. And they were talking about splitting Wildwood. And I thought, no, that's not a good idea. They... Uh, the problem they felt they had was that the, the practical departments and the medical work were having trouble getting along because, you know, when they had a practical man to go in a house, the, the medical work needed that same house for somebody in the medical work. And so there was friction and, and difficulty between the two uh, halves of Wildwood. And so they looked around close by uh, to find some property where they could do the practical on one property and the medical on the other, but they didn't find anything that worked out. And all of a sudden, a piece of property in Massachusetts opened up. And they got the idea, well, the practical people will go to Massachusetts 
and the medical people will stay here and we'll work together and, and do it that way. I thought, no, that's not a good idea. But I was the new kid on the block, and so I didn't even say anything. Maybe I should have, but I, I thought this is a mistake. So 50 people got in a whole bunch of trucks, and they moved up to Lithium. And Jerry Franklin was the leader of it. And uh, after we'd been at Beautiful Valley for... Uh, uh, a so while yes. to at least know that that didn't seem like the best uh, fit for for me or or my wife probably. Anyway, uh, Jerry was interested in somebody helping him, and to be in charge of education, and to be in charge of evangelism. And I thought, oh, that sounds more exciting. I'd had a little taste of leadership and wasn't eager for more. And so I thought, well, this will be great. Education is one of my favorite things. Uh, working, you know, in pastoral type work is one of my favorite. And so uh, I went up and made a visit, and it seemed really good. My wife didn't even get to go. But you that. know what? I was ready to go anywhere, sight unseen. <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> It couldn't have been worse than the mud and the trials of beautiful valley. <laughs> so when we got there, we soon found out that they were looking at each other, trying to figure out how they were going to make a living. And uh, while it had said, you know, the home base here had said, we will support you, but they weren't really doing that. They had given them a whole bunch of granola to sell, but uh, they weren't even selling that too, too successfully. And so, uh, and then to top it all off, Jerry Franklin saw in my coming there a chance to get out and go to British Columbia and start his dream of Sanctuary Ranch. And so pretty soon he says, uh, I'm out of here. And so then they said, well, Pastor Howard, you got to take this. I thought, oh, I just got out of being the leader. And so anyway, there wasn't anybody else to take it over. And so uh, I did. And my wife and I had to start working on starting businesses. Well, the Lord opened up a little place right down on the highway. Now, this place is way out in the country, too. Really in the country. Uh, once you know all the places we've been, you will know why I tried to move Wildwood. But the Lord didn't prosper that, that plan. Anyway, uh, we called a Stony Brook restaurant and health food store. And people started coming to the restaurant. Don Matty, who used to be here at Wildwood, was up there. And he was an excellent cook. And so uh, that got going. Then we had a young man, I even forget his name, but he was really good in agriculture, and he started a greenhouse and produced a lot of food to sell and so on there. And my wife and I started a bakery. My wife started a bakery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she had to do most of it because I was the leader of the institute, but occasionally I helped her. Yes, he would help me by taking care of the two that weren't in school. And um, I went one day, because I had left them in his office, and he has had an interview with somebody. And so I went back when I had a break to see what was going on, and the kids weren't there. And I said, where are the kids? And there was somebody in his office with him, and he like, well, I don't know. Um, they said, well, he, they went out the door about 30 minutes ago or 45 minutes ago. And I'm like, okay. So they were in school with their sister, so it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we had some interesting experiences there that showed God's uh, involvement in the work that we're doing. You know, I wouldn't work in this work if I didn't see God working because you have too many things to face. But I really enjoy seeing God work. It's, it's just amazing. 
And one of the things we had to do, the Institute was in the beginning only for summer use. And so it wasn't insulated and the water pipes were uh, not down very deep in the ground. And up there, you've got to bury the water pipes six feet down. And so we had to uh, try to dig ditches and bury the water pipes. And so one day the men were digging a ditch and they came to this huge rock. And, you know, the rock was too big to go under. To go around it would have been a huge deal as well. And, of course, you couldn't go over it. So they said, well, what should we do? And one of them suggested, we need to pray about this. So they prayed, Lord, help us to know what to do. And so the, uh, uh, they decided after the prayer, one of them jumped down in the trench and started poking around where they were getting next to the stone. And they found a four-inch crack in the rock all the way through. And so they were able to put the water pipe uh, right through the rock. That really uh, impressed me. Another thing that impressed me there, uh, Ethel Wood, who had run the elementary school at Wildwood uh, for many years, she joined us up there and was starting a school. But then uh, she was the only one. I hope I'm getting this straight. Anyway, she was the only one that had any credentials for teaching elementary school. And we needed some others to be involved in teaching. So I went to the local educational leader. And I explained to him what we wanted to do. I said, with us, it's not the degree that's the most important. <coughs> We want to have teachers that really have a personal relationship with Jesus. And sometimes we can't get uh, all of the teachers that we need with the credentials. And so here's a book. I gave him the book Education. I said, if you read this book, you'll understand why we're asking for this. And... Uh, you know, please uh, give us permission to do that. He said, well, I'll have to talk to my committee uh, about it. But he said, I'll get back to you. And so, of course, we were praying at the institution as well. And so he came back to me and he said, you can do it. Uh, we, we will arrange things so that uh, the one license will cover everybody and uh, the rest of the teachers can can go under that. I thought that was a real breakthrough, especially for Massachusetts, because uh, they are really strict on educational thinking. And that was before the day of homeschool. One other, in closing, unless my wife remembers something, um, we had to fix the septic systems. And they weren't, you know, prepared for year-round use. So we had a brother there, I forget whether his name was Palmer or what, but anyway, he had the skill to be able to do that. So he was out there working with a backhoe and, you know, fixing these up, and the, and the uh, local commissioner came by and caught him doing it. He said, what are you doing? And uh, we thought, oh, no, we're in big trouble now. But he uh, looked things over a little, and he said, I didn't see anything. And he walked off, and he left us to finish fixing up all the things that needed to be fixed up. So in our newness and in our, uh, you know, not always doing the right thing, the Lord bailed us out, and we learned that if it's his work, you can count on his help in all kinds of situations. Amen. Anything else? Okay, so we'll, we'll close with that tonight and continue uh, tomorrow.